Okay, so you know how in the season 3 intro, Sprig comes out of the refrigerator looking through a mint chip ice cream cone, which mirrors the moment when he looked through a telescope during the original intro? One could say that he's copying himself in this case. So I can officially declare that Sprig is in fact committing copyright infringement. <laughs> ah, it's good to be back. So, the time has come everyone. Unfortunately, the fantastical and funny feats of our favorite frog folks have finally finished. And if I could be fully frank, my friends, I'm on the fence regarding this fond farewell. Now, don't get me wrong, season three of Amphibia is still a great season overall. The effort and charm that's permeated the series for years is still in full swing here. And I gotta give the crew credit for accomplishing what they did with what little resources and time they had. I mean, we know that Disney's constantly been bugging this show to hop right out of existence, so it couldn't have been easy for them to pull this off. But with all that said, I'd be lying if I said this one was my favorite. Sadly, this season was in no hurry to get going, with half of the 30 episodes dedicated to Earth shenanigans that are very hit and miss. I get it, we all want to chill out after the sensory overload of True Colors, plus I think it's super important for Anne to mend relations with her family before she even thinks about fixing her two broken friendships. But there are certain aspects about these Earth episodes that kind of put me off. The most noticeable thing is the tone. As much as I love seeing the planters enjoying themselves, this is the season where it felt the least warranted. You guys remember what happened to Steven Universe, right? Where a massive world or galaxy shattering event takes place during a season finale, but then the characters mostly just forget about it in order to goof around in their hometown? Yeah, I was feeling a similar vibe here. In the other seasons, the filler felt natural since the characters didn't really have any idea what was going on. They weren't keyed into Andy Serkis' ultimate scheme yet, so it would make sense for them to be happy and blissfully ignorant in most episodes. But here, I don't know, it just feels kinda uncomfortable seeing these characters be so happy-go-lucky when the fate of multiple worlds and all their friends and families hang in the balance and they can't do anything to help at the moment. I mean, if I was in these characters' shoes, I'd be happy to be home or in this new place, but I'd also be freaking paranoid that my world, my friend's world, and countless other worlds are hanging by a thread. I'd have no time for Hollywood tours or food truck shenanigans. I gotta get back there right now. But aside from a few moments of panic from Anne and only Anne in certain episodes, we really don't get that as much as we should. And honestly, I'd be easier on the Earth adventures if they were all really entertaining, but very few of them hold a candle to what came before. Very rarely will you get something as good as Wally and Anne, or Family Shrub, or Hopping Mall, or even Bessie and Microangelo in 3A. Most often you'll get something like Friend or Frobo, or Planters Check-In. Decent, but mostly forgettable in the long run. Heck, I think the main reason the Earth episodes fall mostly flat is because the culture shock of the planters on Earth isn't nearly as fun as the culture shock of Anne and Amphibia. Amphibia was this sprawling environment with swampy lands and giant bugs, and it felt unique compared to most fantasy worlds. We'd see new things every episode and learn alongside Anne how this universe works. But having fantastical characters in a normal suburban setting has already been done so many times in other shows, and they don't really have any unique gimmicks to make this stale idea more interesting. Like how Star had her magic in Star vs, for example. Sure, you got the whole being a giant frog thing, but that can only get you so far. However, if I could be positive for just a second, when this season gets good, it gets really freaking good. The Amphibia Resistance arc during Season 3B is a ton of fun. It really feels like progress is constantly being made as more and more creatures are added to this ever-growing army. They make great callbacks to episodes like Quarrelers Pass, Combat Anne, and Children of the Spore, which I swore were just going to be one-offs. And you have no idea how satisfying it feels to see literally everything they've been building up fall perfectly into place during Season 3B. Sure, you've got the occasional dud during this half, but these episodes contain some of the season's highest highs, including some peaks for the series as a whole. And even if the Earth episodes weren't all great, there's still plenty of moments that hit me right where the warm fuzzies live, while reminding me why I still love this unforgettable cast as much as I do. And on top of the old characters being awesome, there are also some pretty memorable new characters, like Anne's parents who are absolute delights, and Mr. X, who always steals the show, then safely returns it just so we can steal it again. Ah, <sighs> good thing I wore my Heelys. And then of course there's the, um, series finale. But, uh... We get there when we get there! Overall, I gotta give major kudos to Matt and the crew for sticking to their guns and delivering a proper finale to this series, with plenty of noteworthy high points. 
even if it's not my favorite season, it still feels like the same funny, character-centric, charming, and meme-worthy show that we all fell in love with from the start. Disney may be doing everything it can to clear out the cereal aisle, but you guys held fast and gave us one heck of a satisfying conclusion. And I'll always love it, warts and all. With all that said though, which episodes in this final batch are the true standouts? And which are the biggest slogs? Well, you guys know how we roll by now. Every episode gets a review in 10 words or less, a ranking from 1 to 10, with 1 being awful and 10 being nearly perfect. You're more than welcome to rank the episodes yourself in the comments below, and if you haven't seen my seasons 1 and 2 recaps, please check them out. Especially the second one. I had a lot of fun making that one. Let's banish the nude curse and restore balance to the multiverse. It's time for every episode of Amphibia Season 3 reviewed in 10 words or less. Onward! <laughs> Welcome to suburbia life, it don't get simple- OH NO! You know that somewhere Grunkle Stan is cheering on Polly. Fight! 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 Baby fights! Wouldn't be an amphibious season without this duo killing it! Tiny Hawks Pro Skater Food Truck Edition! Kitty shenanigans, Kirby victory dances, and ominous foreshadowing. Perfectly acceptable. Hot Pop's a confirmed Flat Earther and Cats fan. Uh oh. All joking aside, Thai culture is pretty dang interesting. Tears of protagonists restore characters' memories and or life cliche. Sorry, Terminator. Guess you won't be back this time. <laughs> Yo, rue the day you mess with this drag queen. Yeah. Tonight, tonight. We couldn't care less about the Hollywood sign. Spider Spring. Spider Spring does something I honestly can't remember. Marcy, Marcy, the core is now one with you. No, Humphrey, you're too pure for the movie industry. Wait, none of the frogs actually got any cookies. Lies. A cute special with an ending as sweet as... Yeah, exactly. Here comes the Anne in Black, the Anne in Black! Lago being ripped is the best foreshadowing. Okay, second best. A cautionary tale for how annoying constant shipping can be. I'm gonna push some pencils. Straight into your heart. This is only a drill. I know, that's the problem. Mother Ohm's a freaking peach. But lady, clean your ears. Does every bug they fight have to explode? Yes. Oh, that's what cult is short for. Cultivation. <sighs> okay, fine. I don't hate Andreas anymore. When there's a dispute, just summon the newts and tides. 11 minutes of kitties being adorable? Personal biases, activate. Nothing like some pre-war racism to get yourself pumped. Whether it be human or amphibian, Someone's got a crook. Have you ever seen anything so beautiful? Not recently, no. <sighs> I'm not gonna say it. I'm not. Everyone's expecting me to do it, but I'm not gonna do it. I wanna do something more sentimental. Doing that would just be so... So... Ugh, fine. Dawn of the final episode, 22 minutes remain. There, I made the obvious joke. Are you happy now? All right, folks, let's end this thing off with a freaking bang with the final top six best of the series. Yeah, I technically could do a best and worst, because trust me, there were definitely episodes I did not like this time around. But considering this is the show's last hurrah, I want to be as positive as possible. So what do you say we give this swampy show a sweet six spot send off? Let's hop to it. Number six best, Turning Point. After all these years, I finally have them all. Yup, it's the last episode to cap off the esteemed Sasha and Grime BFF trilogy, aka some of my favorite episodes of the series. Prison Break showed us what happens when an unstoppable cheerleader meets an unmovable Toad guy, and planted the seeds for the most unlikely pair of allies in the land. Toad Catcher dove deeper into the relationship between these two, showing off that they truly understand each other's inner struggles, can pinpoint their problems without the slightest bit of hesitation, and can break one another out of their respective funks so they can fight another day. Personally, it's my favorite of the trio. And now we have this one. And while it clearly focuses more on Sasha on her own instead of Sasha and Grime as a unit, it's still got all the goods we could ask for. 
After narrowly escaping certain death at the hands of King Andy, Grimesy and Sasha take refuge in Wartwood for the time being. And while Grime has no problem lying to the residents and taking advantage of their hospitality, Sasha's a lot more cautious and unsure about her actions, clearly struggling with herself after the events of the last battle. But once Wartwood becomes the target for an imminent invasion, Sasha stands up to protect the townspeople, aided eventually by Grimesy, they kick some tin cans into the dirt, and so marks the start of the Amphibia Resistance and the true turning point for Sasha's character. From the midpoint of Season 2 onwards, we could tell that Sasha's manipulative nature was starting to falter a bit, with looks and stares hinting at some regret for what she's doing, and when she's forced to face the ultimate consequences in true colors, where one of her best friends completely breaks off a friendship with her, that was the final nail in the wake-up call for her to start shaping up and stop this controlling streak she's on. This leads to her aiding in the fight against King Andreas and ultimately escaping his capture. And now we have the aftermath of all that, which is beautifully executed. I love the different portrayals of Sasha's deep-seated guilt, from major upfront confessions like her tearful speech as she flips through Anne's journal, to more subtle touches like her not even wanting to step foot in the planter's residence and wanting to sleep in the barn. They really hammer home just how terrible this girl feels for everything she's done, which makes her ultimate choice to stay and fight for Anne's closest frog friends all the more understandable. And while this isn't much of a Sasha and Grime episode since it mostly focuses on Sasha instead of the duo's relationship, there are still some amazing moments from our favorite Toad Softy. Initially, he makes the choice to abandon Wardwood and focus on the bigger picture of the upcoming nude war, and he hopes that Sasha will soon join him. Also, you gotta love how he says please beforehand, showing that Sasha's kindness lessons still stuck with him after all this time. But ultimately, he comes back because while Beatrix has weapons and soldiers, the one thing she doesn't have is Sasha. God, it's so cheesy and cliche, but gosh dang it if it didn't make me smile like an idiot to hear that. And of course, there's the climactic battle scene against the invading robots, which is a great mixture of epic and hilarious. Epic since we get to see more of Grimeshaw's amazing in-battle synergy, but also hilarious because the townsfolk eventually join in, leading to things like Maddie turning the bots into random objects with her magic, Wally wailing on them with his freaking accordion, and Lago just ripping out their eyes and screaming like a madman. Not only did Sasha's kindness training stick with Grimesy, but Anne's example of bravery has stuck with these frogs as well, and they have no problem smashing these bots to save their home. Also, it's just overall nice to see the townsfolk in a casual setting one last time before the apocalypse. I really miss their quirky personalities. While I do prefer Prison Break and Toadcatcher to this, it's a satisfying end to one of the best trios of episodes in the series, and a wonderful jumpstart to the best arc in the season. Number 5 Best, Mother of Alms We all know the many great questions of the universe. What is life? Why are we all here? What the heck was I thinking when I gave this episode a 9? Well, I can at least answer that one for you. To put it simply, this episode is just a chill, low-key, enjoyable time, which we really needed after multiple high-stakes adventures with the Resistance. And when you throw in the best comedy of the season, a weirdly epic trek through an ear canal, and a surprisingly sweet and memorable new character, you get the most unexpected good time I've ever witnessed in this show. After making their way through Proteus, the Ohm's home city, Anne, Sasha, and the Planters meet up with Mother Ohm herself, the one who is said to have the key to their destiny at least according to that old vase they found on Earth. But the poor girl is losing her memory, meaning she has no clue what the prophecy could be. This leads to a fantastic voyage where our heroes must rub some brain cream on Mother Ohm's cranium to help jog her memory, meanwhile Hop Hop and her bond over their thoughts on the drawbacks and benefits of getting old, leading to our favorite old fella getting the boost of confidence he needs to ultimately save the day. This episode is just packed to the brim with nice, pleasant moments. Hop Hop and Mother Ohm talking about their lives while Hop Hop relaxes in a giant cup of tea is so freaking adorable. The poor guy's been having a rough day, especially after being mocked for his old age by a couple of jerk guards. But Mother Ohm, being the sweetheart that she is, reassures him that age does come with drawbacks like aching joints and missing memories, but it also comes with perks like years of experience under their belts. I mean, she would know better than anyone being the keeper of an ancient prophecy and the leader of all Ohms for literally thousands of years. And thanks to this little pep talk, Hop Hop is able to use his most valuable knowledge, his decades of horticultural experience, to whip up a sneeze-inducing mixture of plants that helps his family escape from easily the stupidest danger they've ever been in. And then later on, Hop Hop returns the favor by reminding Mother Ohm of the literal oldest trick in the book. If you think it might forget something, make sure you write it down. And wouldn't you know, the prophecy was written on the ceiling the entire time. You might think it's a little weird for Hop Hop to be having these worries now since he's already proven to be super competent despite his old age before, but hey, sometimes you just have those off days where one or two harsh comments can really put you down. 
I know I've had those before. And sometimes you just need to talk with a friend or loved one to perk you back up. And Mother Ohm does just that. Speaking of Mother Ohm, she's not just the new character of this episode, but she's also the setting, if you could believe it. While Hop Pop chills in a cup of chamomile, the rest of the gang need to journey through Mother Ohm's insides in order to jog her memory. And I'm just gonna say this now, this episode not only managed to make gross out humor funny for me, but it winds up being some of the funniest stuff in this whole season. Despite being a battle-hardened warrior of high caliber, Sasha is still extremely grossed out by things like earwax and snot. And every time she finds herself at the business end of a bodily fluid, it's freaking hilarious. The way she just complains and whines and freaks out makes me crack up every single time. You do feel sorry for her, but I can't help but laugh at her suffering. This is easily the strangest episode of this season from a setting and conflict standpoint, but that's part of the reason I love it. It's so weird having to venture through this worm's gigantic insides to rub her brain with gel while her and Hop Pop have a chill time gelling outside. It's funny, it's memorable, it's reassuring of old people who think that they're losing their edge, it may not be the mother of all episodes, but it's pretty dang close. Also, did you know that that was Whoopi Goldberg voicing Mother Rome? Why did nobody tell me this? Number 4 Best, Temple Frogs Yeah, I'd honestly feel guilty if I didn't put at least one Earth episode on this list. And while Froggy Little Christmas was a wholesome family escapade, and Escape to Amphibia was an action-packed thrill ride, this one was honestly a happy medium between the two, with some adorable character interactions and an extra serving of Tom Kankai soup on the side. And here's word from Dr. Jan that she's finally got a lead on the whole getting back to Amphibia situation. But it's market day at the Thai Temple, and Anne's parents refuse to let her go anywhere unless she spends at least one hour with the rest of their neighbors, especially since she's been gone for so long. The rest of the planters eventually get swept up in the wonders of Thai culture while Anne tries to make a break for the museum. But before she can book it, the Terminator orders a full-on drone strike on the Thai temple, leading to the occupants doing all they can to fight the bots off, the planters being ultimately revealed but eventually concealed by the kind folks of the community, and the big reveal of the Mother Ohm Omen that would ultimately lead them to victory. It's no secret that I find learning about other cultures fascinating especially when creative types infuse said cultures into their projects. It not only lets us understand the tradition of a people that we may not know about, but in the process, we also understand the creators a little bit too. Matt Brawley himself is a Thai-American man, so all of these Thai touches are coming straight from a passionate and credible source, and they leave no stone unturned, including aspects of sports, food, the arts, language, and even simple greetings. It's not only fun getting to learn these things on your own, but seeing each individual planter fall in love with a different group in this community makes for some really enjoyable scenes. Special mention goes to Hop Pop experiencing the art of cone dancing and getting down with his bad self. I will never be sick of seeing this guy get admiration for his theatric skills. It's so precious. And yes, I gotta give credit to one of the most wholesome reveals of the season, where Mrs. Boon Choi talks about how the entire Thai community came together to cook and care for her and her husband while Anne was away in Amphibia for months. I already loved the sense of community that the Thai residents showed off beforehand, but this little moment and the ensuing battle that takes place afterwards just brought everything home for me. Also, since I mentioned them, can I please talk about how much I love Anne's parents? These two are freaking sweethearts, being consistently entertaining, hilarious, and wholesome. The way they comfort Anne whenever she needs it, the way they're all pumped up after their fight with the Terminator, the way Mr. B fawns over Mrs. B's insane driving skills, just... Oh my gosh, these two are a couple of Kinyu beans, aren't they? And I bet you didn't know that Un Brawley, Matt Brawley's actual mother, was the voice of Mrs. B. For someone who clearly doesn't speak English that well, she still puts a lot of genuine heart into her lines, and it makes for a performance that perfectly suits her character. Top things off with an LA Thai vs Dragonfly fight scene, including the ever deadly frying pan, and you have a true standout amongst all the Earth episodes. Long story short, Top see ni ma. Yeah, that's the best I can do, sorry. Number 3 Best, Olivia and Yunan. You know, I don't think the AND episodes get nearly as much credit as they deserve. The power of unorthodox character pairings can lead to some awesome reveals, hilarious interactions, and very unique goings on. Heck, some of these AND episodes like Wally and Anne and Bessie and Microangelo rank as some of my favorites in the whole series. But what happens when the brash loud commander of the Newt army joins forces with the prim and proper lady of the royal court? A fun Newtastic non-adventure complete with golden interactions and a sleep drunk Marcy. Did you expect any different? Both of these girls are pretty much fed up with how Andreas is running the show, and agree that he's gotta be stopped. This leads to an infiltration mission where they attempt to free Marcy from the core, 
only for the Corps to wage a psychological war against them, and Andreas to ultimately fuse Best Girl with his ancestor's intelligence. AKA, we're all boned. Like I said, the main drawing point of this episode is the team-up of Yunnan and Olivia. They've had their fun little moments in past episodes, and they were the key to breaking the protags out of prison in true colors, but this is the first time we see them on their own, working together to achieve a common goal. And they're just as fun as they've always been. Yunnan is still 50 slices of ham, skirting right past enemy fire and avoiding detection without breaking a sweat. And Lady Olivia knows the location of Marcy's prison and helps to fill everyone in on the history of the royal family, including info about the various creatures that they captured on their adventures and the different habits they exhibit. They really do have an opposites attract vibe about them, one being strong and impulsive and the other being slow and logical, and they both contribute to the success of the overall mission. We also get bits of depth from each of them, especially when the core starts playing mind games. We see that Lady Olivia's greatest fear is disappointing her mother. And even though this is all a ruse meant to terrify her into submission, she knows in her heart of hearts that her real mother would be just as ashamed of her. We saw earlier in the episode that her family took a sacred vow to protect the land and everything in it. But after Andreas unleashed his inner Captain Planet villain, everything went to pot and there was nothing she could do about it. And the very thought of it tears her up inside. Meanwhile, Yunnan, the self-proclaimed fearless newt commander, is scared of a tiny little grub hog. You totally get it though, because she had a traumatic experience with one that almost bit her arm off. Even though these two are tertiary characters at best, the fact that they were given some depth in an effective way that totally serves the plot is super impressive. Speaking of which, the entire climax in the core chamber is really freaking cool. The whole hologram gimmick means that they can have some real fun with the creepy visuals. And they deliver. With an image of Olivia's mother perched on top of a pile of dead trees and corpses and sewage pipes. Corpses of living things that are now on Olivia's hands because she didn't do her part to protect the land. Marcy faces off against a two-headed beast of regret, with the faces of her friends expressing their hatred and disappointment in her. And when only one holographic eye is standing, you get... whatever the heck this is. It's a pretty effective visual feast for something that's not a finale. Heck, even the big Darcy transformation, the climax of which is just two frames of animation repeated, is pretty well executed, with sounds and colors that really sell the moment. This whole sequence is just freaking haunting, especially that neck crack and eyes opening at the end. Ugh. Top it off with some nice subtle touches like Yunnan accepting the Moss Man's flower of friendship and then having it in her hair for the whole episode, and a small look of guilt from Andreas as Darcy finally comes alive, and you have an episode that really sticks out during 3A. Also, I don't know if these two are supposed to be married or dating by the end, but uh, yeah, keep, keep doing that. I approve. Number two best, the core and the king. Ladies, gentlemen, and everyone in between, behold your obligatory tragic villain backstory episode. As well as your obligatory me putting this on my best list, because you guys know that I eat this kind of stuff up. I adore origin stories, because if executed well, they can add more likability to a character you are already invested in, or even shed some revealing light on a character that you were on the fence about. Andreas' little self-reflection in True Colors told us just enough about his past, where you couldn't exactly confirm if he was someone who was genuinely wronged and worthy of pity, or if he was just telling the story through a delusional lens. Like he just thought that he was totally innocent and in the right, when in reality, he really is a terrible person who deserved what was coming to him. Well, luckily, this episode sets the record straight. And overall, it's surprisingly balanced. Like, you could totally side with either Andy or his former buddies in this case. Because let me tell you, this poor boy has been through a lot. Andy started off as a happy-go-lucky prince who would spend his time palling around with his buddies Leaf and Barrel, getting into scuffles, screaming down the palace halls, and discovering the universal appeal of twerking before Miley Cyrus was even a fetus. But eventually Andy's old man entrusts him with the key to the music box and his family's legacy, Leaf sees a dangerous vision while screwing around with the box, she tries to push Andy to take her side and stop invading worlds, it doesn't go well, she takes the box away, Andy gets mad, and well, you know what happens after that. Now the reason that I say the morality in this episode is perfectly balanced is because you really can't place the blame on one specific party here. You really do get where everyone is coming from. Sure it's a little mean that Andy doesn't trust his friend's judgement, not to mention having a full on outburst towards her at one point, but you understand that Andy is trying to live up to the legacy of his people while also receiving tips and information from a culmination of the Newt Empire's greatest minds. Like a literal hive mind of geniuses are giving him insight on what he should do. Wouldn't you be inclined to take that kind of knowledge into consideration? 
And to his credit, he doesn't completely ignore Leaf's worries. He gives her an audience with the king and even defends her when the current king calls her a traitor. The poor guy is under tremendous pressure, and his loyalties are split between two very understandable sources. Even when he eventually does lean more towards his father's side, it comes after the biggest betrayal of his trust imaginable. So yeah, I don't blame Andy one bit. He's a bit of a jerk at times, but his actions make total sense. And while it is true that Leaf stealing from Andy after just one outburst that he immediately apologized for is pretty extreme, she was the only one who saw firsthand the catastrophic damage that the Newts can do if they continued on this path. She was mortified by what she had witnessed. And sometimes when you're terrified for your own safety and the safety of others, you make extreme decisions that you're bound to regret later. And it's obvious that she never wanted her friendship with Andy to end, as shown by the note that she wrote for him in the series finale. But we'll get to that later. It really is a major shame that such a strong, healthy trio of friendships had to be torn apart by conflicting ideals. But that's just how the cookie crumbles sometimes. Throw in some goofy Darcy moments, a few good laughs, and a heartbreaking credit sequence where Andy burns the painting from season 2, and you have a blast from the past that will leave Andrea's haters aghast. And the number one best episode of Amphibia Season 3 is a three-way tie between Beginning of the End, All In, and The Hardest Thing. Let's, let's just take this one step at a time. In the same way that you can't operate the Calamity Box without all three gems, you cannot discuss the finale to this series without all three of these episodes. Everything we've been watching and learning and discussing culminates in this hour of animated visual storytelling. And to say that I was satisfied would be selling it extremely short. It would be like trying to peddle a trillion dollar home for a hundred bucks. It just wouldn't be fair. Like all good series finales, it's not something that can be described. It's something that has to be experienced and felt. Which I really hope you all did before coming here, because I do not want to be guilty of spoiling such a masterpiece. But as long as we're all on the same page, let's give this show the final praising it deserves, shall we? The first thing that anyone with eyes will notice is the scale. It is literally out of this world. As these three episodes progress, the stakes continue to rise from small-scale squabbles with ground troops to full-on multiversal invasions with airships to insane battle scenes between a cosmic-powered teenager and a giant newt in a mech suit to freaking Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask Frog Edition. Every time you think the finale has reached its level cap, it just keeps going up, leaving no millisecond of runtime unutilized and no pair of eyes not glued to the screen. And all of these huge feeling events are only made more exciting by the animation and the visuals. So many striking moments from the threatening way Andy's castle looms over the earth just waiting to strike, to the creepy dull orange glow of the core control room every time we cut back to Darcy. And the fight between Super Say Anne and Andy Droid 19 is freaking incredible, with the two smashing each other around with such force that buildings collapse and craters are formed. This larger-than-life robot is flying all around, with this turbocharged girl calling upon the literal powers of kindness to smash him to bits. Eye candy doesn't even describe it. It's like an eye chocolate factory run by both Willy Wonkas that's the size of a small country. Oompa Loompa Doompity Doo, Andy's gonna fight that chick that glows blue, and it's absolutely amazing. However, just like I said in my True Colors review, None of this flash would matter in the least if the characters didn't hold our interests up to this point. And also like in True Colors, no one is left untouched in this episode. Polly was able to show off just how much she's evolved. And I'm not talking about the legs or the hair, I'm talking about brains, baby. Polly went from a wild flail-swinging firecracker obsessed with violence to a smart tactical master of robotics who was able to turn a low-tech robot into a freaking Gundam battle mech with a few spare parts in a high school technology lab. Heck, even before they made it to the high school, the upgrades that Polly constructed in Season 3A helped them to escape a trap that was otherwise impenetrable by the other characters. All the heroes would have been completely screwed if not for her brain power. I mean, she's not completely different, she still loves blowing stuff up, but now she can do it in more creative and intelligent ways. Hooray! Hot Pop, the frail old frog of 68, was able to bust through his years of generational trauma and face the literal and metaphorical monsters that took away his family so long ago. The way he just freezes up and blacks out when he looks at the two herons that took away his loved ones. The fact that he can identify them by an X-shaped scar that he caused by fighting against them in a last resort to save any survivors in the valley. It's such powerful stuff. 
and in the end, he leads his grandchildren in an epic rendition of the Planter Family Hunting Dance, an heirloom passed down through generations, showing that while their mother and daughter may be gone, the spirit of the family lives on in all three of them. And with a simple booty shake, they all tell those herons to sit the frog down and do as they say. This right here, this is a face that demands authority. Grime has gone from a gruff, cold-hearted aggressor who even detested his own soldiers to a toad so humble that he would literally sacrifice his life to save someone he loves. This guy jumps in front of a sure-to-be-fatal swing from Darcy's scythe to save his second-in-command and his best friend, losing a freaking arm in the process. And the speech that he gives about how Sasha has given his life a greater purpose and meaning than he ever would have gotten as head of Toad Tower is so freaking heartwarming. You tugged on my heartstrings in the same way you used to strum those harp strings, big guy. Sprig has moved on from his sporadic, impulsive, childlike behavior, for the most part, and manages to completely save the day with a well-thought-out plan involving a note from his mother, Leaf, to King Andreas. He flies up to the final battle just in the nick of time to spill his mother's emotional guts and stop Andreas's killing spree dead in its tracks, leading to a complete and total breakdown from him. It's because of this little guy that the battle didn't end in Anne being splattered like a bug, and it's all thanks to him finally using strategy. And speaking of Andreas, holy freaking cow. This guy started off as the Santa Claus of Amphibia Kind, and after showing his true colors and true colors, became a full-fledged irredeemable monster in the eyes of every character. And rightfully so. This dude killed and pillaged and destroyed without mercy, so no doubt we're going to see him as irredeemable. Or so we thought, because thanks to some well-placed subtle inflections and some major revealing story beats, it became more and more evident that maybe there was just enough humanity in Andy to reach some kind of redemption. Not a full one, but at least the starting sparks of one. And I gotta say, the scenes where he just stops and feels and cries are incredibly powerful. And Keith David is just top tier in his performance here, literally making me feel for a guy that I once called irredeemable. Throw in his final moment of selflessness, where he sends the robots that used to conquer worlds to prevent the destruction of this one, and you have the biggest surprise in this whole special. Something, Something I should have done, done a long time, time ago. ago. Standing Standing up up to you. Sasha and Marcy are responsible for destroying the core from the inside and outside, utilizing all the things they've learned and the virtues they represent to their fullest. Sasha is constantly demeaned by Darcy, with the core just throwing comments about her controlling nature right in her face. But just when it seems like her strength is at its limit, she regains the power to completely sever Marcy from the core's connection, fueled by the notion that it's not who she was that matters, it's who she is now. And who she is now is a freaking warrior queen who uses her power to protect and serve rather than to control. And Marcy refuses to allow her intelligence to be bundled into the core, rejecting any and all fantasies and methods of escapism from that point on, facing the cold, harsh truths of reality at long last. Truths that really hurt, but will only hurt herself and others more if she chooses to ignore them. But I do love that even when Andreas's father casts her into complete darkness, the BFF photo still remains and glows with light showing that there are things about reality that are dark and saddening, but there are also things that are warm and comforting. Anne and Sasha may not be into the things that Marcy loves, but that doesn't mean that they care about her any less. The brightest and most prominent reality of them all is that they're still friends and always will be. It's a fact that will shine brightly even in the darkest of moments. Wally finally got to prove to everyone that the Moss Man is real. Yeah, that's it. I love that moment. It's so freaking cathartic. And then there's Anne. What the heck do I even say? You want a definitive answer to the question, who am I so badly? I'll tell you who you are. You're an inspiration to the frogs of Wardwood, the humans of Earth, and beings all across the multiverse. You're a hero that stood in the face of danger and refused to budge until it was completely vanquished. You're a friend to creatures great and small that's capable of changing their lives with your amazing heart and soul. You're a teacher to anyone who thinks that they can stand up for themselves or fight for what they believe in, despite physical limitations. You're a dork who doesn't mind letting her weirder tendencies shine in public or in private. You're a member of multiple families that think the world of you, and you're a martyr for the fate of the world that you risked everything to save. You are Anne Boonchoy, and there is no one else like you. I understand that Anne relinquished her godhood because she wanted to live a full life on Earth, and I totally understand that, but if I'm being honest, I really can't think of anybody better to be the immortal guardian of the stones, since she embodies them so freaking well. 
She's grown up so much, and the fact that we were there for every step of her journey is an honor. But hey, if she did decide to stay in Domino Heaven, we wouldn't have this amazing final 10 minutes. Yeah, this final 10 minutes of goodbyes and the accompanying epilogue, this right here is my favorite part of the entire show, bar none. And I loved every second of it. Marcy saying goodbye to the two newts that nursed her injuries, sheltered her, and sharpened her combat skills to perfection. She even says goodbye to Andreas, which completely takes him off guard. But then he returns his gaze to the ground, unable to even look her in the eyes after the pain he's caused her. Sasha and Grime, two of the most battle-hardened bosses of the series, just explode into the biggest tirade of tears and emotion that we've seen from either of them, just bawling with their bestie and hugging them tight before they have to leave forever. And Anne gives each of the planters her beautiful parting words. The sister she never knew she wanted. The grandfather who took her in and did everything to protect her. And her best friend forever. In this universe or any other, it'll always be Spran against the world. If there's anything that we learned from this episode, it's that the hardest thing is saying goodbye. But goodbye is almost never the end, because we'll always remember the ones we love since they leave an impression on our lives that will always be unforgettable. And then the whole series wraps up with the final scene where we see what happened to all of our favorite characters. With Polly growing a body, Sprig gearing up to explore parts unknown, Hop Hop growing his avocado empire after all, and of course, Anne and friends meeting up once again 10 years later for her birthday. And the ending monologue that Anne gives us about how friends often drift away and do their own things, but ultimately return in the end, is not only fitting for the series, but kind of fitting for me too. I didn't cover the show as extensively as most other people out there, heck I skipped a significant chunk of it, and there are plenty of times when I regret that decision, but at the end of the day, when the time came to say goodbye, I came back. I came home. I rewatched the whole series to say a final farewell to the show I loved, and I couldn't be happier that they wrapped things up with such a nice conclusion. I think I've said all I can about this three-part finale. It really is amazing beyond words. The visual scale, messages, characters, emotions, payoffs, returns, and ultimate fates of everyone and everything were satisfying to an immeasurable degree. Amphibia not only stands as an amazing example of a great animated series, but a poster child for the effectiveness of serialized storytelling. I will defend episodic shows till the day I die. But when you properly construct an overlapping narrative with setups and payoffs that blow you away and characters that grow with every passing adventure, all culminating in one final epic conclusion, I can't think of a more rewarding watching experience than that. And I just hope that one day Disney execs can get that through their thick gold-plated heads. If you still haven't checked out Amphibia yet, please do yourself a favor and binge this bad boy. It not only shows what effects a well-told story can have on you, but how important it is to have amazing characters to go with that story. Characters you care about to your very core. And even amongst all the bumps and rocks on the adventure, even when you have moments of disinterest and times when you just want to leave and take a break, you ultimately come back to visit because you miss them and you want to see where they all ended up. These three episodes make up one incredible finale that I can easily call my favorite episode of the entire series. And it should go without saying that it is also my favorite episode of season three. Before you all leave, I'd like you all to join me in a little song for Matt Brawley and his crew of talented, hardworking people. Link in the description. As a way to thank them for making such an awesome show. But if you're really in a hurry, I guess that's all I've got for you today. Feel free to tell me what your favorite episodes of Amphibia are. Favorite seasons, favorite characters, just favorite anything would be cool. Let's all share some final memories in the same way the planters shared their home with us for three seasons. And with all that said, thanks for tuning in everybody, and I hope to see you all real soon.